I just want to thank you all so much for coming out to welcome the new director of the Department of State Lands, Mary Abrams, into office. We are going to wish her all the best in office, and we call on her today as her first step in office to deny a wetlands fill permit for the Moro Pacific Coal Export Terminal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah! So the DSL works to ensure a legacy for Oregonians and their public schools through sound stewardship of lands, wetlands, and waterways. You know, sounds to me like as such, they are a key decision maker on plans for coal export terminals in Oregon, especially right now on the port of Moro. So right now, they're in the process of making a decision. They can, they can grant a permit to build the first Port of Moro export terminal, and they are going to decide by December 12th. But they have an opportunity to deny it or delay it, so we yeah. could see a positive outcome. Yeah. 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 So as Abrams takes office, it is essential she understand that coal exports are her number one priority. She has a responsibility as the new director um, to protect Oregon from this dangerous threat. She must deny the removal fill permit because coal exports is not consistent with the Oregon Department of State Lands priorities. It's not consistent with their mission, so they need to step up and do the right thing. And so we're calling on her today. We are eager to work and cooperate with her to make this happen. I really wanted to come today and tell a little story about what happened in our city of Milwaukee. Several months ago, we had folks in the community talking about coal exports and what that would mean to our community. And we really had a split city council on what we wanted to do and how we wanted to tackle this issue. As we looked at the potential of coal being exported through our community, we listened to uh, coal proponents, coal opponents, people from the United Pacific, um, Union Pacific Railroad, folks from the proposed coal export terminals. We really spent about three months reviewing the pros and cons of coal export. And as we concluded, we heard from all, from five of our seven neighborhood associations that they wanted to oppose coal export through our community. We heard from over 85 residents that, were, that made up the Milwaukee Coal Task Force, which is a grassroots effort that was formed in the city within just a few months. We listened to both sides, we weighed the options, and we developed a strong resolution that opposes coal transport through our community. Yeah. 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 Now further, I've been working to communicate this with other mayors throughout our region. Uh, just last week I worked with Mayor Kitty Piercy of Eugene to create an op-ed that we sent to the Oregonian stating our position. Uh, I joined 33 other mayors in cities across the region, Oregon, Washington, and shipping coal by waterways and by rail transport has the potential of seeping those dangerous toxic chemicals like mercury, heavy metals into our groundwater so that we can all have suffer the ill effects I'm sure Dr. Harris will speak to here shortly. Um, but I just wanted to reiterate what, what uh, we've been talking about here by saying that uh, the call for further examination of coal export is loud and nonpartisan. So the city councils of Portland, the Dalles, Hood River, Mosier, Eugene, and Milwaukee have all requested a comprehensive environmental impact study. Great. But for now, in the absence of a comprehensive environmental impact study, we call on the State Department of Lands to deny this permit for the Moro Pacific Coal Export Project. Yeah. 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 As you all know, there were over 16,000 residents of Oregon that submitted public comments against this project. So I stand here with you today to prevent Oregon from being a coal chute to the rest of the world for climate change. We were here about seven months ago speaking at this same place in front of the same building and we're back. And uh, it's nice to see some of the same faces, uh, but my, how times have changed. Since that time in April, the uh, governor's on board, many of these cities are on board uh, trying to push for environmental impact statements or a health impact assessment before any decisions are made on coal transport. Um, coal companies, you know, have been running these expensive ads on TV. 
And this has become really an issue uh, of special interest versus the public health. Uh, we Oregonians said no to coal a couple of years ago. Uh, that was when the decision was made to shut down the coal burning power plant in Boardman. Uh, we don't want to burn coal, we don't want to breathe coal, and heck, we don't want to export it either. Yeah. So, so we here in Oregon decided to move on and we're developing renewable energies like solar and wind. But now these multinational uh, companies are coming to us trying to convince us that we're on the wrong track, so to speak. <laughs> that the burning of coal is really just fine. We're just not so supposed to ask uh, where it's being burned and who's going to be affected. Um, you know, if it's being burned in Asia and China, is it any uh, less polluting to the children of China than it is to the children of America? No. I don't think so. Uh, coal power used to supply about 55% of the energy needs, the electricity of this country. It's now down to 36% this year. So what is the response of coal corporations? Well, it's to move their markets overseas. Uh, coal exports increased by 24% in the first six months of this year. You know, it's a, similar, uh, it's a similar scenario to what happened with cigarettes. As American cigarette consumption plummeted, they took it over to Asia, and they're doing the same thing with coal. Coal companies want you to consider just one uh, issue, and that's jobs. Uh, and there are actually relatively few jobs that would be created. But what they don't talk about is pollution, air quality, health, and safety. And I'd like to address those a little bit. Because all of us support jobs, but is it, is it, should it be at the expense of the quality of life that we have come to expect here in Oregon? No way. No. 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 Thank you. This is fun to talk at rallies. <laughs> I'm not used to that. <laughs> so coal is by far the, the dirtiest of all the fossil fuels with much cleaner sources of energy like natural gas and renewables, uh, we don't want to facilitate or enable the burning of coal anywhere. If Oregon exports cheap coal to Asia, it's going to drive down the cost of, of coal and it's going to uh, promote more building of coal burning power plants in Asia. And we're going to be going in the wrong direction, the, the direction that Oregon has already decided they didn't want to take. So what is so harmful about coal trains? Well, frankly, they're left open, they're uncovered uh, to lower the risk of spontaneous combustion where the whole car just bursts into flame. Um, two to three percent of the coal load is lost along the tracks, uh, which means hundreds of pounds of coal dust are, are you know, go up in the air from each, from each car of the 128 cars in the coal train. Um, the powdery coal that we're talking about is from the Powder River Basin of Wyoming and Montana. It's very friable. It's not the hard, anthracite, dense coal from the eastern states. The more wind and the more curves along the uh, railroad lines, uh, the more uh, coal dust goes up in the air. Well, does wind and curves sound like the Columbia Gorge? You know, I think so. And we also get a little rain in this, in this state. And uh, rain just sort of drives the coal dust down, drains out the bottom of the cars, it gums up the tracks, and it goes into the groundwater. So we sometimes hear that Powder River coal is cleaner uh, than other sorts of coal from Asia because it does contain slightly less sulfur. But let's be clear, coal is not clean. Yeah. There is nothing clean about it and the Powder River coal actually contains less BTUs than Asian um, coal, so you have to burn more of it than you do uh, from the coal from Asia. Coal dust also contains a number of toxins, including mercury, lead, arsenic, and cadmium. It's a trigger for asthma. It causes chronic bronchitis and emphysema. No one wants to breathe coal dust, and no one wants to have coal dust on their yards. Uh, and on their gardens, um, not where their kids are crawling around and not where they're eating the food. And no one should. Thank you. Nobody should. Coal dusts are powered by 400 horsepower uh, mega diesel engines, which leave a pall of smoke dust in their wake. Diesel engines themselves cause asthma, chronic bronchitis, heart disease, and are carcinogenic. 
the very small 2.5 micron sized particles from diesel get all the way down into the depths of the lung and they carry 40 other uh, carcinogenic or potentially carcinogenic uh, molecules with them. Just want to mention derailment of coal trains. In the past four months there have been some 18 derailments of coal trains across the country. Uh, four deaths, uh, two in Illinois and two in, in Maryland. And the deal here is that you've got three or four uh, diesel engines that are pulling the coal trains but they're so heavy then they have to have another diesel engine at the back at the end to push this whole thing along so if if these heavy trains start to derail then they accordion you know sort of a zigzag fashion and they spill a tremendous amount of their coal generally the companies don't do a very good job cleaning it up when they do derail um, Another issue is the uh, health risk of people who are living near the tracks, within earshot of the tracks, because of the incessant rumbling of the trains. I think maybe some of us can relate to that here. Um, it's certainly been found to create uh, sleep disorders, that's no surprise, but also increased hypertension, heart disease, depression, and anxiety from those who live near the tracks. And this is really an, an, an environmental justice issue because who lives near the tracks, it usually tends to be the poorer people. Um, clearly there's a major difference here between coal miners who choose to work in the mines and the general public, including asthmatics and elderly and kids and those with chronic bronchitis, um, who have not consented to breathe coal dust uh, in the air. As many as 60 coal trains could pass through the Portland area, 30 empty and 30 full, each day. They travel at a maximum speed through the towns of 25, or 15 to 25 miles an hour. Uh, and that means that they, they delay emergency vehicles like fire trucks and ambulances for up to five minutes at these grade level crossings. Five minutes is about the same time that you start to get death of cardiac tissue following a heart attack. So coal companies like to talk about jobs, but they don't talk about the negative economic impact on local businesses, adversely affected by the noise and soot and by the delays. Also, what about the, um, the effect on the property values, on tourism, not to mention the lost days of people from their businesses and schools uh, because of hospitalization or because of asthma. So do we care if this coal is burned in Asia? Yes. Yes. Yeah, sure we care. If it's too toxic for American children, it's too toxic for Chinese children. But beyond that, what Asia burns comes back to haunt us as blowback. This toxic material gets in the trade winds and it floats back across the Pacific. Um, and this is mercury and sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides and ozone and 50 other toxic chemicals that are coming back and they're landing on our, on our uh, slopes of our mountains and on our land and they're washing off into our rivers and reservoirs and lakes and this is the fish that we eat and this is the water that we drink. It's been contaminated by Asian uh, coal power plants. A 2008 study found that uh, the mercury on the slopes of Mount Bachelor, 18% of that came from uh, Asian power plants. Uh, mercury, as you know, is a potent neurotoxin. It damages developing brains in fetuses and young children. Uh, it causes attention deficit disorder, learning disabilities, mental retardation, seizures, uh, and disturbances of gait and speech. In addition, coal burning power plants are one of the leading causes of greenhouse gases and global warming. It's, you know, it's nice to have that subject sort of coming back up uh, to uh, people's consciousness. I think it took Hurricane uh, Sandy to uh, strike at the heart of the media empire to sort of raise consciousness that what we're talking about is really a much bigger picture issue and that's global warming. Um, global warming as you know is not some hypothetical model about something that may happen in the future. It's actually here with us right now. Uh, Oregon has warmed up two degrees Fahrenheit uh, since 1970. Uh, sea levels have been rising at one inch uh, per decade um, since 1900. We've already lost about 25 percent of the snowpack uh, which occurs in April in this state um, over the course of the last 60 years. 
And of course the loss of snowpack means diminishing runoff in the spring, which is going to affect our clean drinking water, uh, also our recreation, water for fish and wildlife, hydropower, farming, and a bunch of things. And we've also seen the effects of the pine bark beetle. Uh, anybody that's driven up to the Sandy M Pass, uh, this used to be killed because of colder winters. With the milder winters, we're seeing the devastation in our forests. Uh, we've also seen uh, increased forest fires. Uh, there was a Pole Creek fire a couple of months ago. Nationally, we're experiencing increasing tornadoes. We had the most severe drought uh, of the last 80 years in the South and the Midwest. These are all tied into to global warming. Um, so I just want to end by saying that coal companies know that burning fossil fuels is pushing this planet to the brink of irreversible warming. Uh, I had the privilege of hearing Bill uh, McKibben, a uh, climatologist, speak a couple of nights ago. And he was using language like uh, that the coal companies are a rogue force. He says they are, quote, outlaws who violate the laws of physics and chemistry. Really, to be mining, shipping, and burning coal is really immoral in this day and age. We need to be sequestering coal in the ground, where actually that's where it is already, and that's where it needs to stay. So in summary, I just want to say that uh, coal exports from the Northwest uh, provide little benefit to Oregon and a whole lot of risk. Uh, there's multiple health and safety issues. There's little to be gained and there's much to lose. Uh, this is an example of profit to the few versus the health of many. So coal export is both a state and a local issue. And it really is important now to be putting pressure on the people that are going to be making decisions. Uh, we're asking for both an environmental impact statement and also a comprehensive uh, health impact assessment. And it really does matter to contact uh, the governor, to contact your state legislators, also to contact your uh, congressional representative and uh, senators. Uh, these are decisions that are going to be made uh, probably over the next uh, several months. Uh, and public input is going to be very important. So together, let's stop coal trains and also coal exports dead in their tracks. I live in Vancouver, Washington, and like many of us, I love to spend time in the Columbia River Gorge, one of the most beautiful places in the world, hands down. My favorite sport is windsurfing, and one of the best places in the world for that is the Columbia River. Coal barges threaten my health and safety and that of all windsurfers and all recreationists on the Columbia River. Barges are a hazard on the river because they can run over you if you can't get out of their way. Barges are difficult to stop or maneuver, and they're dangerous for tourists that are unfamiliar with them. Plus, they create a wind shadow if you're close to their downwind side, and they pollute the air in the water. If you are close to, their, to the river, you can see and smell the diesel in the water. In fact, when you're in the water, you can taste it, which isn't very nice. <laughs> Amber Energy has said that they will eliminate visible coal dust coming off the barges. But what does that really mean? The smallest coal dust particles that you cannot see is what gets deep into your lungs, and we all know that that causes lung cancer and asthma. I have seen how much coal comes off the coal trains in the gorge now, with just six trains coming through each day, and apparently more than that. Along the Columbia River near the coal dust, along the Columbia River near windsurfing launch sites, I was easily able to gather up handfuls of coal dust in chunks right off of the ground. The dust contains mercury, arsenic, and lead. It's poison for us and for the fish. If that's a bad thing now, just think what it will be like if the dozens of coal trains and barges come through the gorge and dump their coal dust. The coal trains would also block access to popular sailing and kite launches as well, and as well as blocking emergency vehicles when there are accidents. Wind sports are a major part of the economy in the gorge. People travel from all over the world and the region to recreate here. We have a reputation in the Northwest for clean air and clean water and beautiful sightseeing of the vineyards and the mountains. Do you think that many people would want to come out here and spend their money? No. no, no. <laughs> Do you think they'd want to spend their money anymore if we have ugly coal trains, barges, and the resultant pollution storming through the gorge? No. no. So not only would coal exports pose a threat to my health and safety and to the health and safety of others, but it will also hurt our economy. 
I am not the only one with these concerns. Both the Columbia Gorge Windsurfers Association and the Columbia Gorge Kiteboarders Association have voted to oppose coal barging for this and other reasons. Numerous cities have also expressed their concern and opposition to coal barging as well, including Hood River, Mosier, and my own city of Vancouver. Of course, in the wake of Hurricane Sandy and the summer of record droughts across the world and the United States, what should be on everybody's mind is climate change. We have worked hard here in the Pacific Northwest to stop burning all coal by 2025. Right now, Amber Energy wants to ship coal through the gorge while we are working so hard to reduce our carbon footprint to create a safer, healthier environment and we spent millions of dollars on salmon recovery just to have the coal travel through, to be burned in Asia, to send mercury pollution back here with the jet stream and to be dumped in the Columbia River. It makes no sense. <laughs> I believe we must do better than dirty coal. Director Mary Abrams, I ask you to do the right thing and deny the permit for this dirty and destructive coal ex export project. The, this gift basket represents all things that could be potentially at risk here in Oregon by the transport of coal. There's apples in here, there's wine, there's hazelnuts, all of, and there's salmon. All of these things represent items that could be put at risk if we allow coal transport and uh, through the state of Oregon. Um, so this is to, and here's the 16,000 comments that were received by, by residents in uh, opposition of this, of this permit. So I'd like to present this to Director Abrams in, uh, on behalf of all of us. And I also want to mention in case the uh, State Ethics Commission, I think they're somewhere across the street, uh, this represents less than a $50 contribution, so, uh, so we're okay. So on behalf of all of us, to the director, uh, thank you very much for having us here today, and uh, please listen to our concerns. So I would like to big, give a big welcoming applause to Director Abrams, who is joining us now. Good morning, Good morning everyone really great to see you guys all come out here. Um, we very much appreciate your concern and your interest in uh, the overall issue. And we also have received a lot of comments, uh, probably from most of you, plus uh, another 15,000 or so of your best friends, <laughs> um, over the course of our two uh, public comment periods for the permit, uh, the application that we have had which is for the work, the in-water work that would be um, happening for this uh, project at, out at the Port of Morrow. Uh, we, are, we now have the information from the two public comment periods. We have the application from the applicant, and we'll be working on making our decision over the course of the next uh, month. And so we will be including your comments as part of that, and we really uh, appreciate the fact that people do take the time to inform us on what they think is important with these projects. Um, so thank you very much for coming out. It's not as cold as I thought it was out here, so <laughs> I was a little afraid you'd get rained on, so. But that's, uh, that's what I, I wanted to let you know, that we do appreciate the time you've spent, and to let you know that we're continuing to uh, consider all of the information we have and we'll make a decision based on that information.